I'm Brian Scordato, and this is the idea to start a podcast, a podcast that's been called, quote, easily 10 times more useful than my MBA, which probably says more about higher education than our pod, but it was a nice review. We're going to start sending the pod along with some deeper content each week. So if you're a power listener of Idea to Startup, head to gettacklebox.beehive.com or the link in the show notes. Beehive is spelled a bit wildly. So it's gettacklebox.beehive.com. On to it. Today, we're going to talk through the three archetypes of problems customers will actually solve, which implies that there are others hundreds of problem archetypes that customers won't solve. Let's not choose one of them. This is one of my favorite types of episodes, the Charlie Munger let's try to be consistently less stupid rather than trying to be very intelligent type. Let's focus on the problems that have a chance and ignore all the ones that probably don't. To get to those three types of problems, we've got to first take a quick pit stop, a detour to downtown Manhattan in 2007, to not quite Wall Street, but an office a couple of blocks away, to a company that didn't quite do finance, but just like their location, they did something sort of close. If you squinted, it all looked the same. I just graduated college and spent six months trying to play basketball overseas, but an injury kept me from it. Also, possibly skill level, but for our purposes, let's just say it was 100% the injury. Anyway, I recovered from ankle surgery on my parents' couch, frantically trying to figure out what I was going to do now that my basketball career was over. I'd been an econ major in college, and it was 2007, so finance, I shrugged. A friend from college a year older worked at that sort of finance company and got me an interview, which led to a job I happily accepted. I had absolutely no idea what this company actually did, but I didn't care. I figured it was my foot in the door, and I could head anywhere after a year or two if I didn't like it. I joined a group of 25 other recent college grad hires who all seemed to have a similar thought process. At happy hour after our first day, one of the 25 said to the rest, quote, So, does anyone have any idea what we do? That group of 25 went through a 10-week training program where we found out what our job actually entailed, and it was odd. I'll explain it to you how they explained it to me. Basically, our trainers told us, your job is to track your client's stocks. If your client is Home Depot, you watch their stock all day and try to figure out who's buying and selling so you can tell Home Depot. You might assume, as I did, that who owns your stock is public information or something you could figure out. And it is, sort of. Every quarter, funds are required to disclose ownership, but not before. So an activist hedge fund who wants to fire the CEO of Home Depot could be buying up millions of shares for two months leading up to the end of the quarter and not have to disclose it. But obviously, the CEO of Home Depot would love to know that that was happening. And that was our job. Our goal was to keep an ongoing real-time record of who was buying and selling our client stocks in between those quarterly disclosures. The whole thing makes sense, and you can see why it's important, but we all thought, this is kind of strange. I remember thinking, is this just what finance is? The method we used for tracking stocks was even stranger. There's a thing called the DTC, or the Depository Trust Company, which is basically a book entry system for trades in real time. So you can see the brokerages that execute the trades. For example, If you're that hedge fund trying to fire the CEO of Home Depot, you might use a brokerage, say State Street, to execute the trades that get you your 5 million shares. That happens in real time, and we could see that. So on the day of the trade, the DTC might say 400,000 shares purchased by State Street. But it doesn't say who those shares were purchased on behalf of. Our job was to put together the puzzle to figure out who it was that was behind the 400,000 shares bought. To do this, we look for clues. What hedge funds used State Street historically, or what funds were active in the space. Maybe you even had a contact at State Street you could ask. Legally, this was a tad iffy, but it was highly effective. On the other side, hedge funds knew that we did this, so they'd use more misdirection, like using multiple brokerages to hide what shares they were buying. The product that we gave to our customers was a real-time log of current shareholders based on all of our sleuthing. 
At the end of the quarter, we'd match up the list that we created to the actual filing and see how we did. That, as you can imagine, was stressful. The people who were best able to solve who's buying what got more clients and got promoted and made more money. So why the heck am I telling you all of this? Why did I just go into excruciating detail on my objectively very boring first job out of college? Because all of the smart, bushy-tailed recent grads I was training with noticed the same thing you just did. That this is a totally niche and mostly irrelevant skill and a knowledge base that isn't going to translate to any other job. Since we noticed this, we said that we'd all plan to stay 12 to 24 months max. Then we'd leave and head to an investment bank or a hedge fund or switch careers completely. We all had a foot out the door from the second we got there. And that is why I'm telling you the story. Because at some point, Despite what we all knew about the future prospects of the job, the human thing started to take over. High achievers, of which there were many, of which I guarantee you are too if you're listening to this, focus on short-term achievement incentives. So, I focused on short-term achievement incentives. How could I get better at tracking stocks? How could I get a contact at State Street to game this system? How could I nail a hedge fund moving in and get my boss to announce it to the floor, something that happened regularly? There are two broader points which will tie all of this back to startup problems. Here is the first. I remember one day telling my dad that I'd absolutely nailed a hedge fund trying to get into Abercrombie and Fitch by knowing they'd used a similar strategy a few months earlier, and he said that was great and that he was happy I was doing well, but to, quote, be careful about what I was getting good at. You could be using this time to get good at anything, he said. Make sure it's something you'll be happy in 10 years you actually got good at. And that is the first broader point. Lots of people are spending lots of time getting really good at things that don't matter. Or better put, they're getting good at things that don't lead them to a place they would have chosen in a vacuum. And that all comes back to short-term incentives, one of our favorite things as humans. Another famous Charlie Munger quote works here. Never ever think about something else when you should be thinking about the power of incentives. Short-term achievement incentives urged me to focus on how to better predict hedge fund moves without ever asking the bigger question. What happens if I get really good at predicting hedge fund moves? What does that mean? If I get more and more clients, what does my life look like? In 10 years, where will I be? Nat Eliason mentions this in a post I'll link to in the show notes. He talks about how writing good blog posts and tweets is a skill people can get great at, and it's something that's easy to focus on and improve because of the short feedback loops. But if you want to, say, write a book, that is a different skill. And writing lots of tweets and blog posts is not going to lead you directly to a book. It'll lead you to being good at tweets and blog posts, and maybe you can convince yourself that in some roundabout way it'll get you to a book, but you're doing hoops to avoid doing the thing that'll get you where you actually want to be. This leads us to the second part of why I told you the story. Lots of people make bad early decisions and then try to salvage them with good decisions later on, and this usually doesn't work. This is a thought I first heard from James Clear. He follows it with these three examples. It's hard to have a best-selling book with an unpopular topic. It's hard to have a happy marriage with an unhappy person. And it's hard to make money in real estate if you overpay in the beginning. For me, it would have been really hard to have a career I enjoyed and excelled at if I spent years learning skills that wouldn't contribute to a job I enjoyed. The entrepreneur version of this is what we're after today. It's hard to build a successful startup if you start with a bad problem. When startups show up to Tacklebox after they've been operating for a year or two and say they want to quote get back to basics, the problem is always the problem. They might have made a bunch of good decisions later, like hiring a good team or raising money or following best practices on a product and acquisition channel, but those are all trying to salvage the initial bad decision, choosing a problem people don't care about as the foundation to your startup. The pattern of choosing the wrong problem, then finding wrong metrics to track, then trying to solve it all later is a terribly human one. Let's fight back against it today. Let's go through the problems that are worth solving, the stuff that'll set you off on the path to get you somewhere you really want to be. And let's do it all after 
a little smooth jazz that's got something different today. A live workshop with me, if you're interested. Hey, if you're struggling at the customer interview stage, you know you should do them, you appreciate the value, you just need some help. I'm running a customer interview live on Zoom three-day workshop. I'll help you schedule your first 50 interviews, build the right questions to ask, and set up an internal system to make sure you're continually running these things. Head to gettacklebox.com slash workshops and click on get the details to sign up. We'll send you dates and info once you do. Back to it. Problem archetype number one, the whole. Okay, enough sort of finance talk. Let's talk problems. As I said, starting with a bad problem is the type of decision that no matter how many good decisions you throw at it down the road, you're unlikely to be able to salvage. Spend the time to find the right one. There's a quote by someone smart I can't find that said something to the effect of, if you give me an hour to build a startup, I'll spend 55 minutes on the problem and five on the solution, and I couldn't agree more. There are three problem archetypes that customers will solve, and honestly, I don't love the third. But lots of people are drawn to it, and some of them are actually successful, so you might as well talk about how to go after it the right way. The three types are, first, the hole, second, the teleporter, and third, the status level jumper. We'll start with the hole, my personal favorite and the one I'd urge you to try and find. A good problem stacks the deck in your favor, and there are no better problems than hole problems. Hole problems exist when your customer is stuck in a hole. Staying in that hole will cost them their business or leave them without a spouse or have some other massive consequence. They need to get out. A quick note, if you know your customer is in a hole, but they don't know they're in a hole, then they aren't in a hole. A customer sees the world as they see it, not as we want them to see it. The key characteristic with hole problems is that they're urgent. They usually have a timeline. Every second they aren't solved is quantifiably painful to the customer. It's hitting on loss aversion. Something they've worked hard on is at risk. This scenario leads the customer to be far less discerning. When you throw them a rope, the solution for any hole problem, they aren't going to ask if it's organic. They're going to start climbing it and kiss you on both cheeks when they get out. I think about businesses and the problems that anchor them using a seesaw visual. I know a podcast isn't the best medium for visuals, but this one's pretty simple. On one side of the seesaw is the urgency of the problem. On the other is the quality of the product you have to build. The more urgency there is, the worse product you can build. The reverse is true too. The less urgent the problem, the higher the value placed on execution. It's a much better use of your time to find customers that'll be happy with a terrible product, a shabby rope that gets them out of this deep hole, than to try and build an incredible product that someone strolling down the street will be so blown away by that they'll have to purchase it. It's also far more likely. Nearly all of our successful companies were successful because the problem was so urgent it covered up for endless mistakes on the operational side. Go back to our incentives quote from Charlie Munger. Someone with pain they can feel is incentivized to stop that pain. Other people aren't. Work with the first. Here is an example. Recently, my wife and I took the little guy away for the weekend. It is amazing how a 20-pound human can turn a CRV into a Mini Cooper. After a stroller and pack and play and car seat and diaper bag and cooler full of food and, of course, Ruby's bed and young Rubes herself, all 85 pounds of her, the car was filled to the brim. We got to our Airbnb around 7 p.m. and immediately realized that in all the chaos of packing that car, we'd forgotten something critical, the baby monitor. We didn't know anyone in the area and all the stores were closed. We texted a friend who knows these sorts of things, and in a minute they replied, quote, use baby quip. We googled it and saw that it's basically a rental service for parents. A family nearby had a profile page that displayed all the baby items that they owned and that we could rent along with a daily price. A baby monitor cost nine bucks a day. We reached out and the woman on the other side said she'd be there in 20 minutes and asked if there was anything else we needed. We added a baby bathtub and a wheelbarrow. The baby monitor was nine bucks, but honestly, we would have paid 50 for it. We needed it. We were in a hole and they had a rope. And yes, I know we could have just not had a baby monitor, but we're first-time parents. Cut me some slack. Back to the seesaw. Was the baby monitor the one we would have chosen? Definitely not. 
Did we spend time to see if this person had good reviews? Were we worried about someone coming to our home to drop something off? Did we think about cleanliness or chemicals or the eco impact or anything else that we usually think about when buying stuff for our kid? Nope. We didn't care if the rope was organic. We needed to get out of the hole. Baby Quip itself isn't objectively great. It's buggy, the communication tool is a bit weird, it's hard to search, and they take a pretty big cut. And I don't care, because, again, the whole. Urgent problems are a giant eraser. They get rid of product mistakes, marketing mistakes, even pricing and team mistakes. If you solve an urgent problem, you'll give yourself slack on every other business function. The last and maybe best part about solving a whole problem is that you build an enormous amount of trust with the customer. So last week when we flew out to Florida and brought the little man, we started by reaching out over Babyquip to a family near where we were staying and rented the works, everything we need. And every time we travel from here on out, I'm sure we'll do the same. Looking for a hole as a wedge problem we talked about last week is a great way to build a business. It can be a moat. I feel an emotional tie to baby quip. Finding whole problems is tricky since obviously they're liquid gold to entrepreneurs. The key, as always, is narrowing in on customer, getting more specific on the exact moment in time a customer feels the pain, adding qualifiers to your persona until you get to a place that's too specific for bigger companies to target, then expanding in concentric circles as you nail each slightly less urgent moment. Problem archetype number two, the teleporter. The teleporter problem is all about commitment and process. In this case, you identify a process your customer is committed to and remove the hardest, most painful step. You teleport them past the thing they hate doing, the thing they dread. This requires you to know the customer and their process like the back of your hand better than anyone else. We got pitched by a founder the other day with a classic teleporter business. He'd been in the real estate world for a while, helping people sell homes, and he'd noticed a specific type of customer with a problem. This customer owned a house they wanted to sell, but the house needed a fair amount of work. Usually things like basic repairs, updates to the kitchen or the HVAC system, maybe a paved driveway, that sort of thing. He knew exactly how much these sorts of repairs would boost the value of the house, and he had all the connections to get them done. So his business idea is to give you an offer for your house as is. Then he does the repairs and sells it. The step of repair and update, something that's painful, foreign, time-consuming, and opaque to the customer, is taken out of their selling process. As he started offering the service, he realized the customers who got disproportionate value were the ones who'd recently lost a parent and were trying to sell that house. So he began offering a service to itemize and box everything in the home and move it to storage as well. This gives us an important lesson I haven't mentioned yet. As always, the magic happens later. You probably won't start with some great unknown problem. You'll need to work with a customer for a while to uncover one. The key is to know what that looks like and not settle for less. You won't be able to salvage it later. Commitment, process, most painful step. Finding teleporter problems is usually an exercise in domain expertise. You need to understand the process better than anyone else, which usually means you'll need to have lived it. The shortcut here is ethnographic research. Convince a customer you're interested in helping to let you shadow them for a week. You're almost certain to find some teleporter problems. Problem archetype number three, the status level jump. The last archetype is a lot more flimsy in my mind, but it can work. It is based on the theory, and in my mind fact, that humans are motivated by envy, not greed. Your job is to understand who your customer currently compares themselves to, and what would make them feel like they were better than those people. Ideally, it helps your customer jump to a new group of people. This may sound ugly, but it's how humans gauge success how we're doing relative to the peer group we currently see ourselves with and relative to the peer group we'd eventually like to be a part of. One of my first businesses was a status jump business, although at the time I didn't realize it. While I was working in that sort of finance job, I decided to make a little extra money on weekends giving basketball lessons on the Upper East Side. My pitch was that I would help kids who wanted to eventually play college basketball. I'd done it and I could help them do it too. 
The kids I taught were 10 years old, so they had a little bit of a ways to go. But I thought that was my best differentiating pitch, so I went with it. Plus, it let me charge a few hundred dollars an hour because I said if I was able to get your kid a scholarship, it would save you 400,000 bucks. So 300 an hour was nothing. I couldn't believe I got customers, but now I know why. I helped parents jump status levels. I'd coach the kids one-on-one right next to the group lessons that were happening at the basket next to me for far cheaper. I gave parents a way to show that they cared more about their kid or that their kid was talented or that their kid's goal was to play college, which was different than everyone else's. This let them leave the status level of the other parents. It gave them a scoreboard. I even held tryouts for the honor of doing my silly dribbling drills to add a little bit more exclusivity, and people actually showed up. Status jumps are tricky. You need to deeply understand your customer's job to be done and realize that you are solving a problem with moving goalposts. People were interested in my basketball lessons for a few weeks until they weren't. The goal of any business is to make your customer successful. And with this sort of problem, that can be tricky because of how emotional success actually is and how many other variables there are. It can work, but try it at your own peril. The end. There are lots of things you can do with your life. If you're listening to this podcast, I'd assume that one of those things, probably one of the big ones, is to start and build your own successful company. To improve the odds, I do two things. First, recognize what it is you're getting good at and make sure it translates to the type of life you want to live eventually and the type of business you want to start. Most people never do that, and it's a conscious choice what you do each day, but it can easily be torpedoed by achievement incentives that you don't even recognize. If my dad hadn't forced some perspective, I might still be tracking stocks 17 years later. Second, When you pick a startup to go after, remember that a bad decision early might not be able to be salvaged by good decisions late. The problem you pick is that decision that matters. The only types of problems people solve are the ones that are painful, urgent, frequent, growing, and expensive. Problems they know about. Problems they talk about. If that is not the type of problem you're solving, keep thrashing around in the space until you get to one. And, as always, it's unlikely you'll start with the great problem. Start where you start, but it is important you realize you need to get yourself to a great one to be successful. Whole problems are the holy grail. Throw people a rope. Teleporter problems are close behind. Help people skip the hardest step of something they absolutely have to do. And status problems, those aren't for the faint of heart, but they can work. Most other problems don't matter, and no one solves problems that don't matter. A great problem makes everything else significantly easier, so don't settle. Want to get started on customer interviews? Join our Getting Started on Customer Interviews workshop. Head to gettacklebox.com slash workshops. First come, first serve. We'll send you dates and details once you sign up. Have a great week.